In the town of Herkelton Oaks, Maryland, there's a place where kids can play however they want and be whoever they want. It's a place made by kids for kids and filled with adventure and fun. It is known as The Creek. Within The Creek, there are great characters that span a variety of interests, hobbies, personalities, and morality. But which characters of The Creek are the most pure and heroic, and which are jerks? Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Bench, and this is Craig of The Creek Characters. Good to evil. Craig of the Creek has a huge cast. As much as we'd like to mention everybody, we don't want a video that's over an hour. We are going to touch on the major characters. We're also going to include the most noble side characters and a few fan favorites. All right, let's get on with the ranking. As usual, we'll be starting with the most pure and noble characters and working our way down. These characters are the good. Receiving our gold medal of good is Omar, aka the Green Poncho. For a time, Omar was just another kid at the creek. However, when it became apparent that he would have to stop King Xavier and his forces from invading the other side of the king, Omar was willing to rise up and take on the role of being the new Green Poncho. He may have seemed cold and stern when Craig and the others first met him, but Omar can be protective of the other creek kids, especially Craig. He was also willing to sacrifice his free time to protect everyone else from the king's control. He spent three entire summers keeping watch at the overpass, when he could have been reading comics or playing games with other kids. We have to respect his diligence and inner strength. Even after he felt that he had wasted his time when other kids disregarded his warnings, Omar still put on the poncho one last time. Not for the creek, but for Craig, because he knew how much Craig needed his help and didn't want to let him down. Finally, despite being betrayed by her, Omar offered comfort and a second chance at friendship to Maya. That's admirable, considering everything she did to be the king's BFF. For all these reasons, Omar deserved to be at the top of our list. Taking the silver medal of good, we have Sparkle Cadet. While she may not be an actual magical girl, that doesn't stop her from trying to be a hero. As she says, it's her mission to spread positivity and good vibe, helping those feeling upset or down. Even if they're total strangers, she cares about the feelings of others and wants to help their inner sparkle. Sparkle Cadet tried to help Kelsey through her bad mood, and while her methods didn't work at first, she kept trying. While she encourages positivity and happiness, she won't force it onto others. She's able to offer support to others and be friends with them, instead of seeing them as people to help. Sparkle Cadet was willing to accept that it was important for people to let out their anti-sparkle, or negative feelings, instead of only showing positive emotion. Later on, Sparkle Cadet became close friends with Craig and Cannonball. The three of them help each other and hang out throughout Season 3. Although not actually magical, her goodness and positive attitude are genuine. The Bronze Medal of Good goes to JP, the first of our stump trio. Although he's implied to be one of the older kids of the creek, JP isn't one for trying to boss other kids around. He's optimistic, friendly, adventurous, imaginative, and insightful. Although other kids see him as strange or gullible, JP has a high opinion of himself. He doesn't get goaded by insults like Craig or Kelsey do. This is seen when he and Boris were able to be civil towards each other during the Tea Timers party. Another instance is when he didn't care about proving Big Pinchy was real to Jason. Instead, only wanted to share the discovery with his friends. Out of the main stump trio, JP has the least amount of flaws. Add in that he doesn't start a conflict with anyone as he is the pacifist of the group. Despite his cloud cuckoo lander tendencies, he's able to be a voice of reason. Probably one of his greatest moments was when he saved the creek from being jinxed due to being so unpredictable. Also, even after all that Paloma put them through, JP still offered her friendship. While JP may not always be as heroic as Kelsey or as inspirational as Craig, he still manages to stand on his own as a really good kid. Just behind JP, we have Craig. As the leader of the trio, it's often Craig that's initiating the adventure or making a choice to help out a fellow Creek kid. Throughout the series, Craig loves the Greek, even when the other kids frustrate him. Unlike Kelsey, Craig talks things out first and almost never resorts to violence. He also encourages the free atmosphere of the Creek, encouraging kids to be as weird and free as they want. He never looks down on others for their interest, even when he disagrees with them. Craig works with other kids, like when he created the Creek Council. He even denied the position of king after winning the Capture the Flag War with Xavier because he didn't want to boss other kids. That's not to say Craig isn't perfect. He isn't always honest, like when he gave himself a bad haircut and kept up the charade of being a different kid to get more free stuff. 
He has an ego, like when he became the new ace of Foursquare, though we're cutting him slack since the other kids initiated it. Craig came around. However, his ego comes out around Jason, given the little rivalry the two have, and their conflicting perspectives. But even when frustrated with people like Jason or his older brother Bernard, when he tries to get back at them, he backs down after he understands their perspective or after he decides that he doesn't want to hurt them. He can also be irresponsible and over-imaginative, but these are usual kid flaws. He tries to fix his mistakes, so we're not going to take off too many points for them. It's no surprise that Craig has earned a reputation of being the kid that's always up for adventuring and lending a hand to those in need. Finishing off the stump trio is Kelsey. Being a fan of fantasy and wielding a PVC sword, Kelsey is the kid-friendly version of the Blood Knight trope. She doesn't back down from a challenge and is quick to anger. Because Kelsey thinks of herself as a warrior, she suggests solving problems with force rather than words. Thankfully, these traits don't make her into a bully. Like a knight, Kelsey can be loyal and she stands by her friends or fight for the creek. She can also be kind, like when she encouraged her friend, Stax, to create a secret book club or write her own novel. Kelsey also tried to help a fellow creek kid through the mourning process when they lost their pet hamster. In another episode, a boy from the creek asked her to the tea timers dance. Kelsey struggled between being honest and not wanting to hurt his feelings. It's obvious that for as much as Kelsey may boast about being a warrior, she's capable of doing good outside of combat. Whenever Craig is stressed out or overthinking, she and JP step up as the voice of reasons. We can't forget how she bravely stood up to Maya during the big capture the flag game, despite being afraid of her. Although we had to rank her lower because of her violent tendencies, Kelsey has the makings of a true hero. Up next, we have the secret kid. Though the secret kid is a minor character, what he does in one episode is noteworthy. For his role in Creek Society, the secret kid acts as a confidant. This allows kids a chance to get things off their chest and write down their secrets in bottles that the secret kid then stores away. In other shows, the secret keeper probably would have been revealed to be someone interested in blackmailing others with their secrets or spreading gossip, but that isn't the case. When a flood spreads the secret kid's bottles all over the creek, the secret kid's main worry is possibly hurting feelings of others, should any of the secrets get out. Later on, when Eliza reads out one of the secrets, the secret kid says that the I don't like horses secret was his. He did this so that the secret's true owner, Marie, wouldn't get kicked out of the horse girls. While you could argue that helping kids keep secrets from their friends isn't great, it's clear that the secret kid wasn't trying to be malicious or force people to be dishonest. He's empathetic and wanted to help out kids who felt like they couldn't be completely honest. And that's admirable. Moving on to another important part of Greek society, Kit. She's the manager of the trading tree, which provides snacks and toys to kids throughout the Greek, just as long as they have something good to trade. Kit is a businesswoman, has dry sarcasm, and isn't interested in playing with the other kids. However, she isn't greedy, and while she can be stern and business-minded, she's fair with her trades. Kit will give out free products in certain situations. She would give Todd, who is highly allergic to a variety of foods, free granola bars that are gluten and nut free, so that he can have a snack at the creek too. In one episode, Kit gave a free ice pop to the Riddle Kid, even after being annoyed and frustrated by his riddle. She'll also trade her products for anything that her customers have to offer, except for rocks, misshapen marbles, and high fives. She won't trade for those. So even kids who don't have much can still get something. The main reason why the creek fell to King Xavier was that Kit had been sent to summer school and was forced to temporarily close the trading tree. This instance showed how important of a role she played in the creek and how, if she wasn't around, a lot of kids would be forced to go without snacks and sugar. Not fun. Though she has a temper, Kit focuses on fairness and good deals. Next is the only animal on the list, Mortimer. Although Mortimer doesn't do much, usually sitting on Kelsey's head, we had to mention him. Like Kelsey says, he's part of the group. As a pet, he can give Kelsey comfort when she needs it and is loyal. He'll help her with things, and in Wilderness's debut, he kept coming back to her, even when Kelsey tried to give him freedom. His most noteworthy role was when he had to find a way to save Craig, Kelsey, and JP after they got themselves stranded in murky water. Though he is a good bird, we couldn't place him above other certain characters who have frequently done multiple heroic actions or have done noteworthy things, but he does enough to earn a high spot on our list. Next is Wildernessa. 
Having a Princess Mononoke appearance, Wildernessa is a self-proclaimed protector of all the animals in the creek. With her dog Cheese Sticks by her side, she travels the creek and makes sure that all the animals are safe, happy, and free. While this is a noble cause, what brings Wildernessa down is how rude and even aggressive she can be. She'll look down on the other kids, especially Craig, and sees herself as superior. She thinks this way because of the vast knowledge she has about nature, leading her to sound unnecessarily condescending. Even Kelsey isn't free from this, despite how much admiration Kelsey seems to have for her. She can be aggressive and even try to maul people, though only in retaliation, like when kids at her school played a prank on her. However, after the episode Breaking the Ice, Wildernessa began to soften. She seemed regretful for how she treated Craig. She even sacrificed herself during the Capture the Flag event, jumping in front of Craig to save him from being frozen. Much like the animals she cares for, Wildernessa may have some rough edges, but we can still call her a good kid. She has issues and maybe social skills that she needs to work on. Next is Craig's little sister, Jessica. Unlike a lot of little sister characters in cartoons, Jessica isn't a brat or a know-it-all. However, she had her moments early on. In Jessica Goes to the Creek, Jessica was pestering Craig and refused to break from her normal after-school routine. Although it was understandable due to her age, we still understood Craig's frustration with her in that instance. She also uses puppy dog eyes and crocodile tears to get her way. She also once ran off because she was bored at the salon, forcing Craig to go after her. However, this is the worst that Jessica gets. Any other time, she's really sweet. In the Thanksgiving episode, she and her cousin helped distract the adults while Craig and Bernard tried to fix the ruined pie. She helped other times too, like when she crawled through a baby-sized jungle gym to rescue Kelsey's sword. In another episode, she took care of younger kids at the Creek Daycare. She may not be a major character, but when Jessica shows up, she does more to help than to hurt. At the very least, she provides cute comic relief. Next is the Sewer Queen. From her kingdom in the sewers, the Sewer Queen is a fair and proactive ruler. She ensures that the needs and happiness of her subjects are met. Through her guidance, what would have been a gross and dangerous place to play became like a water park to her followers. The Sewer Queen made her kingdom a place of acceptance and safety. As someone who's been laughed at for webbed toes, the Sewer Queen made her kingdom a place for all kids, regardless of how they look. She also served as one of the main defenses to protect the home team's flag during the Capture the Flag War. The Sewer Queen is a kind, noble, and hardworking ruler compared to another kid royal we'll get to later on. The only reason she isn't higher is because of her small, though still notable, role in the show. Up next is a Creek's library kid, Stax. He prefers reading over playtime. Stax helps kids find any book they need. With how much she loves reading and talking about books, she'll offer to write book reports for other kids in exchange for candy. Not the most honest service, but we're sure it's still helpful to a lot of kids. But what makes Stax notable is her friendship with Kelsey. For as much as Kelsey may encourage her, Stax offers just as much encouragement in return. She can also be a loyal friend, like when she went through the extra effort of helping turn Kelsey's novel into a real book at the library. Being at the library all the time doesn't give her much of a chance to go on adventures or do heroic deeds. However, the role she does play is meaningful. Following her is one of the horse girls, Manny. Outside of McKinsey, Manny is probably the horse girl with the most development and spotlight. She's also the kindest and most inclusive of her, Herd. She encouraged JP to become a horse boy so that they can spend more time together. She calls out McKinsey for trying to sabotage JP during the horse obstacle course. Then, she comforts Mackenzie when she learns the real reason for her jealousy. Afterward, Mamie accepts JP for who he is when he says he doesn't want to pretend to be a horse anymore. The two eventually become a couple, and their relationship is wholesome and sweet. Though awkward and shy, mamie has got a good heart, though that's not to say she won't jump into action when she needs to. She pretends to be Kelsey's warhorse by giving her piggyback rides, something we're sure Kelsey appreciates. Next is one of the 10 speeds, Cannonball. Although Handlebar is the leader of the 10 speeds, Cannonball represents them on the Creek Council. He also gets more focused than Handlebar, so it was only right to give him a mention. Despite having a bombastic name, Cannonball is a chill dude. He can be quiet, but when he speaks, he's giving others encouragement and being friendly. Even when he's competing in the Creek Kart Race, he maintains a polite and friendly demeanor to his rivals. When he first formed the Ice Pop Trio with Craig and Sparkle Cadet, Cannonball teaches Sparkle Cadet how to ride a bike. He's supportive of his fellow 10 speeds, and we don't have anything bad to say about him, but we wish he had more screen time. 
Next, we're ranking two of the Creek Elders, Elder Barry and Elder David. They're the oldest members of the Creek. The Elders spend their time playing tabletop games in their cave and provide information to the Creek kids on things from the 90s. In terms of personalities and morality, Barry and David play several notches above the third Elder, who we'll get to in a bit. Barry is pleasant and is happy to offer information. However, he can be annoying, like when he was hanging out with Craig and JP. He kept bringing up shows they never heard of making it hard for them to enjoy themselves. He can also be pushed to anger, though only in intense and personal situations, like when he finally blew up at Mark for being over-controlling. Overall, he's decent. As for David, he can be a beat, almost to a fault. He's also passive. He hates when his friends fight, but it isn't unusual for him to pick one of them to follow. Like Barry, he's friendly to the kids who ask him questions and seems decent. While the elders aren't bullies and do serve a purpose in the creek, they don't make much of an effort to do more. They didn't even help during the big capture the flag war, so for being as nice as they are, we had to put them on the lower end of good. Next is the Honeysuckle Rangers, Raj and Sean. Being from the other side of the creek, these two were originally antagonists, representing the other side's hostility. Like most kids on the other side, they tried getting into the king's good graces by first trying to steal Craig's map. However, before their big heel turn, they weren't bad kids. Though sneaky, they were never hostile or that mean. They actually offered to help Craig find Jessica before they knew about his map. Later on, after being fed up with King Xavier's attitude towards them, Raj and Sean helped free the stump trio. From then on, Raj and Sean helped the Creek kids take Xavier down, from giving intel on the King and his resources to helping Kelsey and JP with stealing Xavier's candy during the Capture the Flag special. While they may have technically started off on the wrong side, they've done enough to make up for it. That's it for the good characters, now it's time to descend into neutral territory. This is the gray area. First is Bernard. Like most older brothers in cartoons, Bernard isn't the nicest. It's not uncommon to see him casually dismiss Craig or mildly insult his interest. However, it'd be more accurate to describe him as aloof and a know-it-all, rather than mean or a bully. Although he wants time to himself and tries to be mature, he helped Craig out multiple times. He eventually teaches Craig how to play Bring Out Your Beast and teaches Jessica how to play Power Punchers. Although he's freaked out, Bernard also tries to protect Craig when he thinks a monster is after him and their friends. Probably the nicest he's ever been was in the Thanksgiving episode, where Bernard let Craig know that he still cared about him and that they'd always be brothers, even if Bernard was no longer sitting at the kids' table. Though he can be a jerk, it's never pushed too far, so a high spot in the gray tier was perfect for him. Underneath him, we have Bobby, also known as the kid who always goes, my candy. Bobby is the definition of an ordinary kid. Though he claims to be Craig's best friend, he's often doing his own thing. The show makes fun of this when the stump trio believes Bobby's moving away, only to realize they have no memories of him. Bobby isn't a complete blank slate, however. He has an intense side, one that came out when he played Foursquare with Craig. Thankfully, this secret competitiveness didn't overtake him. The Halloween episode showed his intense love of candy. He tormented and terrorized Craig's dad the entire night. He threatened to trick him if he didn't get his treats. This was mostly played for comedy. However, what wasn't a joke was the part Bobby played during Capture the Flag. Despite originally believing in Craig's efforts, Bobby was the deciding vote in letting King Xavier into the creek because of the candy that Xavier was offering. Later on, it was revealed that Bobby gave Xavier the phone number of Craig's mother, believing that it was for his own good. Of course, once he learned the true reason Xavier wanted it, Bobby was apologetic. He tried to make up for his betrayal by helping out during the Capture the Flag mission. Though his sweet tooth may cause him to make questionable decisions, Bobby is more sweet than sour. Next is the Witches of the Creek, Tabitha and Courtney. Technically, they're only goth teenagers and not actual witches. However, they don't correct the mistake. They enjoy playing along with it to mess with kids younger than them like Craig and his friends. The witches can be snarky, and Tabitha especially seems to enjoy freaking the younger kids out. Courtney keeps her from going too far, even if she finds it amusing. Although they lie about their witch status, they still use their so-called witchy powers to help Craig and the others when they're desperate. This is seen when Craig believes he's cursed, or when the trio is dealing with a haunted dollhouse. Even with their more mischievous tendencies, the witches are more helpful than harmful. Courtney volunteers at a cat shelter and sympathizes with black cats. For this reason, we've placed them in the upper half of gray. Next is Toman. 
Being the Creek's resident jock, Toman can be egotistical when playing games like Foursquare and basketball. He gets a kick out of messing with the other kids, like when he came up with a bunch of different Foursquare rules to make it nearly impossible to play fairly. This is also seen when he started a game of The Floor is Lava without warning. It's also common for Toman to brag about how great he is at all these games, making up an endless number of nicknames to make himself sound cooler. But like the witches, Toman has a soft side. When he's not playing sports, he's growing tomatoes in the creek, showing he can be more than a jock. He also once gave Craig advice when Craig was struggling with the title of Foursquare Champion. Toman even used his Flora's Lava skills for good during Capture the Flag. He's still annoying. However, these moments of actually being helpful keep him from dropping any lower. Representing the Forest Scouts, we have Jason. Jason had an interesting arc. Originally, he was an arrogant busybody, only interested in bringing order to the creek and using his so-called authority as a junior forest scout to boss other kids. It's no surprise that he and Craig didn't get along at first, especially since he went after the stump trio. Besides being bossy and rude, Jason has tried to use his rank as a scout to get free stuff. Though these attempts aren't too successful, Jason tried to save the trio when they were trapped in their stump, but after learning that he wasn't going to get any award for saving them, he left. Jason also once, inadvertently, flooded the stump due to Jason performing a routine safety inspection. He forgot to close the lid on the stump afterwards. It was after this episode, after Craig spared Jason's badges, that the two slowly stopped being such intense rivals. We eventually learned that Jason is insecure. He cares what others think about him and is aware that he's not well-liked, causing him to feel lonely. In one episode, Jason was excited when he thought that the trio actually wanted to hang out with him. Then, he got angry when he realized the trio only wanted to look for something in his backyard. Then, in Season 3, Jason briefly becomes part of King Xavier's crew as a double agent, allowing him to relay info to the Creek kids. The fact that Craig trusts Jason to do this without any worry about being double-crossed shows how far these two have come. Next is Mackenzie, the second of the Horse Girls. As the leader of this herd, Mackenzie is bossy. She leads all the activities that the horse girls do and will critique the girls if they aren't horse-like. As for kids outside of their herd, Mackenzie is closed off and looks down on others for not being as graceful and wonderful as a horse. This is true with the 10 speeds, when Mackenzie and Handlebarb argue about whether biking or galloping was faster. Probably her worst moment was when she tried to sabotage JP at the horse obstacle course, not wanting JP to replace her as herd leader. What keeps her from going any lower is that she only wanted to mess up JP's obstacle course run. She was horrified when her attempts at sabotage actually injured him. Mackenzie never wanted to hurt him. This may be a low bar, but the horse girl clears it. Just under her is the Junk Lord. Junk Lord has a hard time letting go of his things. He was antagonistic towards people who came to the junkyard, especially the 10 speeds. Along with disliking thieves, the Junk Lord looks down on people who throw things away in general. This is partially because of his ability to see value in things that other people deem to be worthless, a trait both he and Craig share. Eventually, he was able to let go of a few things after being shown how by Craig, even if it was still tough for him to do so. He doesn't get a chance to do much outside of his debut episode, but even though he hasn't done much in terms of heroics, we can't call him a villain either. Next is Paintball Mike. Mike leads his army of kids against his brothers, Paintball Benny's army. He also represents the paintballers of the Creek Council, although he isn't known for making compromises. When it came to the circle game, Mike insisted that the game didn't need any rules and refused to vote on adding them despite all the damage and chaos that the circle game was causing. It took being bested in the game for Mike to finally agree on the new rules. He can be prideful, but will reluctantly admit when he's lost. Being a soldier, Mike can also be brash, intense, and rude to other kids. However, even Mike has his limits. He was appalled at Benny when he learned that his brother was essentially using first graders as cannon fodder. He insisted that the war was only supposed to be between middle schoolers. In this instance, we will give him credit for making a deal with his brother to get the first graders off the battlefield. Staying out of the bad tier is Elder Mark. As the unofficial leader of the Elders and their dungeon master, Mark is the most rude of the three. He snaps at the little kids that ask him questions. He often shoves or yells at his fellow elders. He has little patience for others, condescending, and takes his bossiness to another level when the group plays D&D. 
In the episode exploring this, Mark railroaded his fellow elders into playing his way. He didn't want to divert from the campaign he had set up for them. However, the three of them eventually talked things out, and Mark apologized for not compromising. Other times, though, Mark has a hard time owning up to his mistakes, such as when he doubted Kelsey as a valuable knight, thus placing the blame on David and Barry. He can be selfish, like when the elders were trapped under their rock, and Mark wanted to waste their last bit of food so he can use it for his shrine. Eh, makes him look awful. While Mark is a jerk, he's never crossed the line into being an antagonist. The one time he was an antagonist, the others were able to talk him down and make him acknowledge his mistakes. Additionally, he plays a role as an elder of the creek. Even if this is a small role, he's technically helping kids when they come to him. That wraps up the gray area, now it's time to take a look at the villains of the creek. These characters are the bad to evil. Starting off the bad tier is Turner, a card game anime antagonist wannabe. Although she may look shy and sweet, Turner quickly proved to be a very talented bring out your beast player. When Turner first learned that Craig had the beast snare card, which allows players to take all the cards and keep them, she convinced Craig to throw it away. Of course, this was so she could have the card and become practically invincible. Following this, she went on to beat and steal the cards of nearly every beast player in the creek, and had to be stopped by Craig and Bernard. Turner is sneaky, cocky, and selfish. Though there's nothing wrong with collecting cards or being the best at a game, the way Turner went about it firmly puts her in the bad tier. Next is another bully of the creek, Big Red. She's another one of Craig's rivals and earned a day in the spotlight when she became the main antagonist in an episode. Big Red once held the record for sucking on a pucker sucker, and when Craig challenged her record, she tried to stop Craig from finishing the sour candy. Big Red nearly succeeded, though Craig is still victorious, much to her dismay. Outside of this instance, she's mostly taunting others and being a jerk. Next, we have Carter, the cardboard inventor. Carter started off friendly, appealing to Craig's building tendencies and being a kid that was really into cardboard. As we got to know him, Carter was more than an eager cardboard crafter. Originally, Carter played in a cardboard city with other kids. He kept trying to insist that they build higher and add amenities like drawbridges and running water. However, when the other kids said that they didn't want to play that way, Carter left, saying that he'd one day get them to understand the true value of cardboard. That day came, when Carter tricked Craig into helping him build a cardboard mech, which he used to attack Cardboard City. It's later revealed that Carter was also jealous of his friend Zoe, spending so much time with the early Cardboard City settlers. After he's defeated by Craig and spared by Zoe, Carter leaves and swears revenge. Later, Carter tried to replace his brain with cardboard, becoming Cardborg. These kids really take their game seriously. Even when Craig tries to reset him, Carter runs off again. Eventually, Carter is able to get back to normal and make amends with Zoe. However, this doesn't make up for him trying to destroy a city of cardboard due to his ego and jealousy, so we had to put him in the bad tier. Next, we have Bridget, the leader of the Fredites. The Fredites was a cult-like group that followed the guidance of a dog named Fred. They would allow Fred to make their choices for them so they wouldn't have to. However, as Fred's interpreter, Bridget eventually turned the Fredites into a cult of personality that followed her and her alone. Although Bridget initially presents herself as someone looking out for kids with decision-related anxieties, she gets angered when she, or Fred's, decisions are challenged. She even blamed Fred's disappearance on Craig for not following through on Fred's decision, and the group got angry with Craig. Bridget then starts a pet seminar in which she claims to teach kids how to take care of pets to convince their parents to get them pets. However, this is a scam, and in reality, Bridget was tricking kids into pampering her. Bridget goes as far as to put on a dog costume and act like a dog, just so she could be taken care of by the Fredites. Though it's not unusual for kids to pretend to be animals, this is, this is weird. Bridget is selfish and manipulative, but she has a minor role in the series, only being a focus in two episodes. So we couldn't put her below other characters who have shown to be bigger threats. We couldn't forget to mention the rogue camper, Roxy. Roxy was a sleepaway camp runaway and played the part of a helpless little kid when the stump trio found her. They soon learned that Roxy was anything but sweet and innocent. Before her escape, Roxy had apparently seriously injured several other campers with an ice pop stick, incited a riot in the camp mess hall, and threatened a counselor with a macaroni ninja star. When her cover was blown, Roxy threatened to hurt Mortimer if the trio didn't let her escape. She then glued their hands together so they couldn't stop her, leaving them trapped around their stump. Eventually, Roxy broke down and admitted to how homesick she was. This gave her camp counselor a chance to comfort and encourage her to give camp another try. We're cutting Roxy slack since she was emotionally distraught, 
we can't overlook all the physical damage she did. Getting into our bottom five, we have Paloma. It's easy to feel sorry for Paloma at first, given that she was forced into silence for a year due to an unlucky jinxing. However, it doesn't take long for Paloma to become an antagonist. Once she starts jinxing, the entire creek. Her jinxes were of the you owe me a blank variety. In Paloma's case, she asked for choco rolls and earned herself a pile of them. She turned on the stump trio, even after they had helped her, and she didn't care about betraying them. When Paloma was defeated by JP, it was assumed that she regretted her actions and had a chance of being friends with everyone. However, during Capture the Flag, it was revealed that Paloma had joined King Xavier's side, becoming a member of the Cherry Blossoms. She used her jinx powers to stop Toman's game of The Floor is Lava, causing the Creek kids to lose their advantage. Uh, so much for the hope of eventual friendship. Next is the lowest of so-called high society, Eliza of the Tea Timers. Because she's the leader of the Tea Timers and initiates their worst deeds, it was worth ranking only her. Eliza tricked kids into coming to a Tea Timers party. She promised her guests a delicious tiramisu. However, in reality, Eliza only invited kids that she knew wouldn't get along. She wanted to have them fight for her entertainment before she kicked them out. This episode showed her manipulation and malicious intent, given that she tried to push Craig into destroying Jason's badges. Even after her scheme is revealed, Eliza continues using other kids to entertain her. She uses real dessert now instead of fake dessert. Eliza is known for stirring up drama, like when she found one of Secret Kid's bottles and threatened to reveal the secret to the creek. She offered the other kids a chance to trade for the secret, but only if they traded their most valuable things. Even her position on the Creek Council doesn't give her any good points. Eliza only focuses on things that concern her, and she voted in favor of King Xavier coming over to their side. She's awful, but there are worse kids. Earning our bronze medal of evil is Maya, King Xavier's BFF. Back when she was friends with Omar, she was given a choice by King Xavier, fight for the title of King's BFF or be a normal kid. Maya, wanting to be respected, chose to fight, even if it meant going against her closest friend. Since then, Maya grew to be Xavier's greatest and strongest fighter. She eventually goes up against the Green Poncho and Kelsey, and could even destroy Kelsey's sword. Not an easy task, considering it's made out of PVC. Knowing her authority, Maya isn't above taunting others, even enjoying it. She throws down without holding back. As the series progresses, however, she regrets her choice to follow King Xavier. She understands that without the king, she'll be alone since after three years of being his lackey, she's pushed all of her other friends away. This makes her desperate to fight, even when it becomes clear in Capture the Flag that she doesn't like being friends with Xavier anymore. We're cutting Maya's slack since she regrets the things she did, and it's implied that in the upcoming season of Craig of the Creek, there's a chance for her to be redeemed. That's more we can say about our remaining entries. For our silver medal of evil, we have King Xavier's champions, Aggie, Jackie, and The Blur. None of them get much development or background info besides being part of Xavier's court, so it wouldn't make sense to rank them separately. They all do the same things and are on about the same level of badness. All three have their own special talents and skills that Xavier uses to his advantage. The Blur is a speedster that messes with his opponents. Jackie's got a killer arm and can turn throwing things into a deadly skill. And finally, Aggie is a king's muscle and proud of it, being intimidating. Combined, they make a team that can put any kid who tries to stand up to the king back in their place. Unlike Maya, who only fought for the title of BFF to get respect, the champions are kids who wanted to be part of the king's inner circle. They do this for superficial perks, like free candy and extravagant sleepovers. They never have moments of doubt or regret like Maya, which is why we had to put them under her. The gold medal of evil goes to King Xavier. Younger brother to former kings, Kenneth and Cheyenne, Xavier proved to be a more spoiled and ruthless king because of his rich kid status, Xavier rules by acting friendly and handing out free candy. However, in exchange for these treats, Xavier demands authority, allowing him to boss the other kids with ease. Whenever someone does something he doesn't like, Xavier shuts it down, and for kids who refuse to cow to his demand, they either get thrown into his maze or get blackmailed. In Capture the Flag, Xavier secretly sabotages Kit's report card. He gets the trading tree shut down, making it easier for him to win the favor of the now desperate Creek kids with a promise of candy. Xavier also isn't above going to parents and making claims of being hurt and bullied in an attempt to get them grounded. He did this with Craig. While Craig's mother didn't believe him, not every kid has a mother as understanding as Nicole. As such, we're able to see how he was able to intimidate others into backing down. Xavier is also prideful 
and will ban things he doesn't like or is terrible at. He thinks that if he can't enjoy them, then no one should be able to. What makes Xavier the worst is his selfishness. To him, friendship is a one-way street. He'll pit two best friends against each other if it means having the stronger one as his BFF. If his friends disappoint him, he sees them as useless and threatens to replace them. It doesn't matter what they want, Xavier only cares about what he wants, and he'll do whatever it takes to stay in control. Calling him evil may be harsh, considering Xavier is just bratty, but we have to give him the title of most evil character in Craig of the Creek. That's it for the morality spectrum, let's head over to the medals. We're going to give the Pride Medal to King Xavier. Being king of a creek, of course he would be proud of his status, viewing himself as the greatest king and wanting others to do the same. Xavier's BFF, Maya, has earned the Envy Medal. Maya was always after respect and deeply envied those who had it, which eventually pushed her into doing whatever it took to finally get some respect for herself. For the Sloth Medal, we're selecting all three of the elders of the creek. Outside of answering the occasional question, these guys really don't do much, barely being able to help themselves themselves or the creek for that matter. The Wrath Medal had to go to Kelsey. While it's usually a righteous fury, she has some anger issues and doesn't seem to let anything stand in her or her sword's way. For the Gluttony Medal, it could only go to Bobby. Although he's willing to share his sweets, the fact that Bobby is always eating candy and can eat a whole 10 years worth of it at a time earns him this medal. We're giving Manny the Lust Medal for her huge crush on JP. Other characters in Craig of the Creek have had crushes, however, Manny was the most obvious about hers, and she actually entered a relationship. Aww. Finally, for the Greed Medal, we've selected the Junk Lord. Although his hoarding was the result of seeing value in the things others threw away, the Junk Lord still took the concept of collecting and scavenging to a whole new level. Alright guys, that's a wrap! Let us know in the comments section if you agree with our ranking, and tell us what we should cover next. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge our Good to Evil playlist, where we break down the morality of the characters in your favorite cartoons, shows, and movies. But most importantly, stay wicked.